Well, thank you all so much for your patience and welcome to the second of three parts of today's um, exciting, what we call colloquially relaunch of the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center here at American University. For those of you who I have not had the pleasure of meeting before, my name is Sarah Clark Kaplan and I have the honor of being the executive director of the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center um, and faculty here in literature and critical race, gender and culture studies at American University. Thanks to all of you who are here today in the room, despite the hecticness of the current days, and to all of you who managed to show up on Zoom for yet another panel. I'll be speaking to you today about the new research initiatives that the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center is undertaking as part of its new uh, mission and vision. But I'll also be trying to give you a bit of an overview of what ARPC has become and the directions in which it is heading. But I think the most exciting thing that we're going to get to do in the next two hours is to have an opportunity to see the lifeblood of this center and part of the lifeblood of this university, which is our incredible faculty affiliate group which you see some of here. ARPC is lucky enough to have almost 60 faculty affiliate members from across the university. While the center is located in the College of Arts and Sciences, we see in the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center a breadth of research approaches, methodologies, and fields of study ranging from finance and real estate to education, from media and markets to environmental studies, from geography to studio arts and performance. We are truly an interdisciplinary center connected by a shared commitment to research and practice that pursues racial justice and leads towards intersectional liberation. Now, before we start, I have the honor of also having with us today, one of our um, most incredible advocates and one of the leaders and thought makers in, on campus today in these areas. Dean Linda Aldori, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, who has joined us just this year from the University of Maryland, where she served as an Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs and Research and a Professor of Communication, as well as the Director of the Center for Humanities Research in the College of Arts and Humanities. We are, welcome, we are welcoming Prof uh, Professor Aldori and Dean Aldori today as part of the work that we are doing, which she has already shown incredible support for, and as an opportunity for her to let us know a little bit more about how she understands the role of the center in the college. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Is there a microphone or? It, 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 it doesn't matter. Put it in okay, great. Hidden in the podium. Awesome. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you so much for that introduction. I actually just wanted to take a minute to welcome everybody because um, I'm so delighted to be here. I wanted to give context of the college a little bit. So the for many of you who know this, the College of Arts and Sciences is home to 19 academic departments that encompass the humanities, the arts, social sciences, and the sciences. You are here in the Hall of Science, for example, where much of the science research is conducted. But there are also 12 centers and institutes devoted to cross-disciplinary research and education in focused areas that are priorities of both the college and the university. And the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center is one of the flagship centers of the college. And I am committed, as Sarah said, to supporting its mission of dismantling racism in its many forms and forging relationships across the college and university, as well as throughout the city and the country. For me, when I was interviewing for this job, which I took only two and a half months ago, so I appreciate the <laughs> faith you already put in me knowing so much about ARPC, but one of the exciting points about taking this job, an incentive to take the job, was actually to work with ARPC and to learn from ARPC. So I'm so excited to have that opportunity. And I'm hopeful as my first academic year begins to witness Sarah's vision for ARPC being put into action. Collaborations with communities outside AU, creating a place that enables students and professors to conduct anti-racist scholarship and building a reputation for ARPC as a collaboratory. 
pulling together faculty and students from different fields to create change. And today is just the beginning of that. I thank you all for being here to share in the celebration of ARPC, Sarah and her team. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Eldori, for that. And thanks to all of you again for your patience as we get started. Uh, I'd like to take a moment now to just give thanks to the number of people who have made today possible. Many of you may know that I arrived at American University just about a year ago and have spent the last year on what I refer to as an extended listening tour, where I've sought to get the lay of the land and to understand exactly what it is that makes American University unique and what makes this center unique. And one of the first things that I have discovered is that it is actually the community of faculty, staff, and students here at AU that make it possible for the, for the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center to thrive in an institution like this. So I'd like to start by thanking the number of people who have both made it possible for us to reach this point in our revisioning and recommitment to the work of racial justice and decolonial liberation and those who've made it possible for today in particular. I'd like to thank the College of Arts and Sciences Dean's Office and all of the staff in there, particularly the staff in events, development and advancement and communication. I'd like to thank both Dean Eldori and Interim Dean Max Portwangler, who really did uh, remark, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> um, Erica, you were on my mind. Um, to thank everyone who's made it possible for us to do this kind of work. I'd also like to thank, of course, Provost Peter Starr, who um, did much of the work of bringing me on board and giving me the lay of the land, and who continues to support this center, both materially and morally in all directions that we seek. I'd like to thank our team. We've been lucky enough to hire a phenomenal leadership team over the last um, six to eight months. We have hired two incredible associate directors, Associate Director for Outreach and Operations, Kaylee Bryant Greenwell, who you'll see standing over there. So we were lucky to move away from the Smithsonian where she's worked in programming and community engagement for a number of years. And Associate Director for Faculty Engagement and Initiatives, Lily Wong, who many of you know is a remarkable scholar um, in literature and critical race, gender, and cultural stu and culture studies here at AU. I'd also like to thank our interim director from last year, Melanie Ranganathan, who um, I can honestly say uh, did far more than keep the boat afloat or the seat warm, but actually managed to forge a path toward a new vision and a new direction for the center that I've been lucky enough to follow in and who gave me both the pragmatic and theoretical framework from which to build. I will remain eternally grateful for that. And while she is not here yet, I'm sure she will be later, uh, former managing director, Christine Platt, who has been part of the center since its first inception and has shown the flexibility and adaptability to continue to not only grow with the center, but to help us continue to grow. We are very lucky. Um, our incredible faculty affiliates, who you will have an opportunity to speak with and hear from today, who are truly, as I said earlier, the heart's blood of the center in all ways. And of course, our administrative team internally reaches deep and wide. Our community coordinators, both Kira Bunkholt, our community coordinator for community outreach and American University alumna, and, and C.D. Marvin, our community coordinator for campus outreach, who is back there, probably live tweeting as we speak, China Brody, our events intern, and Sophia Dean, our incredible jack of all trades and student of mastery of all things social media related. That was Sophia and Stevie, it was not me. Um, but I did click on and like them and then I realized that they were posted from my account, which is the ARPC account, so that it was kind of tacky to like them. Um, but you know, it speaks to where we are. So enough of the silliness, I'd like us to get started with a brief discussion of where the center is and where it is going. And then what I'm looking forward to, which is hearing the work of our incredible affiliates as an example of some of that. 
our research center has a saying that we use a lot to think about what we are doing. We are doing research in action for social change. In that short phrase, we summarize the key elements of what we understand our center to be about. First and foremost, we are a university center. We believe in knowledge production. We believe in the value of new knowledge. We believe that cutting edge research and innovative approaches to naughty problems is the only path forward toward real structural change. You cannot solve problems if you do not understand them. However, we are no navel gazing or ivory tower institute. Our goal is to use that research in accessible, actionable, and sustainable ways. We put our research into action, and we understand that the knowledge that we produce here on campus is only partially usable if it cannot be shared and combined with the knowledge that is created on the ground and in community by activists and artists, change makers and organizers, students and community members. And finally, for social change. Our goal is not simply the dismantling of racism, though that is absolutely a lifelong goal that we would be happy to achieve in our lifetime. I, you know, we're not the first or last generation I think who will say that. But we aspire, however hubristically, to more. We seek not simply the end of racism, but the achievement of racial justice. Our goal is not simply reducing inequality, but in fact, intersectional liberation. We believe that social transformation, while an idealistic and perhaps not quite yet achievable goal, is what we should all aspire to. And the pragmatic steps that we take in our research and our practice towards achieving it are part of that everyday work of freedom. So I'd like to introduce you to our new mission statement. For those of you who are on Instagram, you'll see it was launched last night. The Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center is an interdisciplinary hub for the research and practice of racial justice and intersectional liberation. We convene scholars, educators, community-based change makers, cultural workers, and policy advocates in sustainable and equitable collaborations. Together, we generate critical knowledge around race, power, and difference and forge shared tools and resources for social change. Of course, the one sentence version of that or the one phrase version of that is research in action for social change. So part of what I'd like to stress about our new mission statement as we move forward is that we remain committed to both research and practice. But as we move into this next stage, we extend the application of our research beyond policy making or policy analysis to think about all of the terrains on which social justice research can be put into practice, whether it's through cultural production or grassroots organizing, community advocacy or harm reduction. We seek to bring together the wisdom of scholars and educators with the experience of community-based change makers, the creative impact of cultural workers, and the practical skills of policy makers in order to produce new coalitions in the service of racial justice. Now, racial justice is a big term, and it means many things. So what I'd like to really stress for now are the points of intervention that our leadership team has identified as our starting points of focus. This is not a permanent list, but this is for now, the list that we are using to frame where we prioritize our research, our community collaborations, and our public programming. This list is drawn in part from what we see happening in the world around us. I think there's nothing on this list that one of you won't think, oh wait, yeah, that's, that's an issue right now, today. It is urgent, it matters now. 
but it is also drawn not simply from desperation or anxiety or fear, but from a place of strength. You can also identify, if you look at our list of faculty affiliates, at least two, three, four, five people on this campus with strength, expertise, and innovative approaches to thinking about each of these issues. From race and carcerality to reproductive justice, gender-based violence to migration, arts and racial justice, environmental racism and climate justice, anti-racist education, economic justice, decoloniality and indigenous justice. What you will hear today from our remarkable faculty affiliates are examples of the amazing and innovative work that our scholars on this campus are doing in these areas. Of course, at the same time as it's necessary to become very clear about what we mean by racial justice, at least for right now, it's also important for us to know what we mean by doing work. We have four initiative areas, and those initiative areas are part of our attempt to become a holistic 360 degree focused center. Our goal is to combine an active research agenda and the support and catalyzing of new research with ethical, responsible, and rich community collaborations with community-based organizations and grassroots movements, to engage in educational work on campus and beyond, and to maintain our robust public programs, and in fact, expand them beyond events to incorporate resource sheets, toolkits, and other ways in which public members and community members can take the information that we provide and apply it in their everyday lives. And for today, if you want to hear about all the initiatives, you'll have to come to the reception where I'll be talking about. I talked, each of these events is a little different. That's why we're doing these all day, not because I just really like standing up in front of people all day, I promise. Um, but this morning, this afternoon, we focused on our educational initiatives and our campus outreach initiatives, which are really targeted towards staff and students. For this little bit, I'm going to really focus on research initiatives because that's who we are and we're not ashamed. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about community collaborations and our public programs tonight at the reception, very briefly. Currently, our research initiatives center in three areas, some of which you will have seen around and about on email and on our website. First and foremost, our fellowship programs seek to support and expand cutting edge scholarship on race and racial justice, as well as the scholars who are doing that work. Whether it's our faculty fellowships through ARPC and the Jackie and Richard Meisenberg Fellowship for Intersectional and Transnational Research, or whether it's our graduate student fellowship in public history, we seek to enable scholars to do the work that they do and to produce the kind of scholarship that will change the field and the world. Second, we convene research collaboratories starting this year. Our research collaboratories, which other people might call working groups, bring together faculty, community members, artists, activists and thinkers around some of the critical issues of our time. So this year, we'll be convening two collaboratories, one on race and carcerality, and one, actually, race and carcerality, but more specifically, I will say abolition, um, specifically thinking abolition, and one on race and reproductive justice. Those two working groups will be tasked with the opportunity and the ability and the responsibility to create new materials, whether it's a conference or a white paper, a special issue of a journal or an art installation piece that contributes to our knowledge and conversation on these key issues. Our research collaboratories will be chosen annually and they will be advertised widely for faculty at AU to join, to apply to join. They will also be opened up in small numbers to faculty at area universities who are working in similar areas to enable a cross-pollination of research and practice across the DC metropolitan area. And third, our project incubators. 
Our project incubators are in part purely pragmatic. They are designed to help faculty who are working together to create new and innovative research that is not yet at the stage of receiving external funding to be able to have administrative support and some financial resources as they develop proposals for external funding. But not all projects are necessarily designed for external grants. We also seek to function as incubators for those kinds of projects that just require a little bit of time and effort, a meeting space, a convener, someone to bring the right people into the room and to ask the right questions as faculty researchers begin to think across disciplinary boundaries and research terrains. Those are our primary areas of research. Of course, those areas of research are closely connected to community collaborations. And I will simply say this before I turn it over to our faculty. Our research collaborations are in part of our are part of our sorry our community collaborations are part of our research projects in part because so many of our faculty are doing community based research which you will see today and we know that we can model our community collaborations off of the kind of work that our faculty are already doing and so the community collaborations that we seek are reciprocal and equitable they are sustainable rather than burning out on either end or created for the purposes of one research grant or a one-off survey. And they are community-led. We know that for our faculty to trust us to be involved in their long-standing community partnerships, that we have to come to the table with political commitments and ethical commitments in shared leadership, shared decision-making, and shared goal-setting and that it is our responsibility to enable our faculty researchers to share not only their knowledge and expertise, but their resources and their access to university. And so we see our community collaborations as existing hand in hand with our research initiatives as part of a broader project to produce knowledge both on campus and beyond. And now as an example of that knowledge production, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. And I'd like to take a moment to introduce our very first speaker, Malini Ranganathan. Malini Ranganathan is Associate Professor in the School of International Service. She's a critical urban geographer and political ecologist by training who draws on ethnography, historical and legal archives, in decolonial and critical race theory to study the root causes of environmental and climate injustices in India and the United States. And Malini is an excellent representation of our work in environmental racism and climate justice. So I'd really like to extend a very, very sincere thank you to Sarah, to Lily, to Kaylee, to Sophia, and Stevie, um, the staff at ARPC, for hosting this relaunch. I'd also like to start by thanking uh, my fellow faculty affiliates. You know, um, and Provost Starr knows this, but when I was first asked to step in as interim director for the Anti-Racism Policy Center um, in the summer of 2020, amidst a global Black Lives Matter uprising and reckoning with systemic racism, I wasn't sure that, that I was the right person for the job. But then I spoke to all of you and we had connections, personal and professional. Um, and you affirmed to me that you wanted the center, that you wanted to make the center inclusive and that you would throw your weight behind the center. So I, I wanna take a moment to really, really express how grateful I am that, um, that, you, that you chose to, to help stand the center up and that together we succeeded in, in, in bringing here a formidable leadership team. So thank you for saying yes. So as Sarah said, I am a critical geographer and a political ecologist who studies the root causes of environmental racism and environmental casteism in urban contexts. What I am calling in my work environmental unfreedoms because they entail the robbing of dignity and life and they entail dispossessions related to land, labor, and ecology. I've conducted long-term ethnographic research in India, primarily the city of Bangalore, which has seen an uptick 
in right-wing fascism, Islamophobia, and ethno-nationalism, all of which have intensified forms of violence, including environmental violence against minoritized groups. I also work on US urban contexts, primarily Washington, DC, which are framed following black radical and indigenous theorists as a case of internal colonialism, given its particular and peculiar political and governance structures, its apartheid geography, and its uneven climate, housing, and food insecurity. So in doing this transnational work, both located in India, which, which I call one home, as well as Washington, DC, which I call another home, I reflect on my positionality, right? And I try to bring that reflection, uh, both as an insider and outsider in both these contexts, to my research and to my teaching and train students also to reflect on this. So I'd, I'd like to outline two projects, um, and I'll just put a third one up there, related to the broad theme of environmental and racial justice. But what I wanna signal at the, at the outset is the overarching concern that is threaded to my, through my work is how environmental harms are driven by racial regimes of property. So this triad of property, racialization, and ecology form the sort of tripod upon which the rest of my work is scaffolded. In a first project, land struggles in the capitalist city. I consider the range of movements and storytelling practices that challenge land grabs perpetrated by corporate and elite classes, including the theft of wetlands, riverbeds, the urban commons, and public land reserved for the poor. This cluster is culminating in the publication of a co-authored monograph out with Cornell Press in April of next year. Co-authored with AU Lit Professor David Pike and feminist geographer Sapna Doshi, and drawing from ethnography in Mumbai and Bangalore, as well as novels and fictional films set in cities across the post-colonial urban world. Corruption plots, stories, ethics, and publics of the late capitalist city argues that we should care about how ordinary people talk about corruption. Stories about corruption are at core stories about economic injustice the ethics of city making. These stories tell us that corruption is not some aberration of the market as the World Bank would have us believe. They are not the result of some lower civilizational status as uh, colonial rhetoric long ascribed to third world bureaucracies, right? Rather, we identify corruption, not of the system, but corruption as the system. And it's through these storytelling practices that we really get a sense of how people ethically and emotively feel about economic injustice. <laughs> At the same time, corruption talk is used opportunistically by right-wing leaders such as Trump and Bolsonaro, and of course we recently heard about the uh, election of a right-wing leader in Italy, to other racial, ethnic, and sexual minorities. So we contend that it is time that scholars take seriously corruption as a global st storytelling practice about the ethics of racial capitalism and all its contradictions. So this book was supported by a 2017 to 2019 Mellon American Council of Learned Societies Research Grant, as well as an AU faculty grant. A second cluster, which I'm calling racial and climate justice in Washington, DC, stems from my longstanding interest and abiding commitment to urbanism, ecology, and activism um, in the global South, and is based here on a decolonial counter reading of scholarship that separates the so-called study of the first world and the third world, north and south. Anti-eviction groups in Washington, DC draw from tropes such as the slumlord, featured commonly in stories of the global south, to describe the abuses of landlords in DC, a city which is 60%, um, the population 60% renters, and um, a, a sort of dwindling percentage of African Americans um, as gentrification continues to go at, at, at very fast speeds. So, I start by looking at housing activism because that was my expertise and interest. Um, and I realized that it's situated in a longer history of segregation, the war on drugs, um, runaway gentrification, as I just said, but also a vibrant history of black and left activism. So in this context, my question is, what might climate and environmental justice mean? And here are images of actually a, a stomp out slumlords protest that happened um, during COVID in 2020 
um, as well as a climate justice um, protest, which was the People's Climate March in 2017, kind of tying together questions of housing and climate. Um, it's also really fascinating that they use a, a cockroach to depict a slum, a, a slum lord, which is, of course, a very large, like Sanford Capital or Blackstone group, um, because not only are, are, you know, in Marxist literature, are slum lords seen as parasites, but also because of the ways in which large landlords perpetuate um, roach infestation and mold infestation, which are very bad for, for indoor air quality and exacerbates asthma, particularly among black and brown minorities. And so there's a lot of, so the cockroach is very symbolic here for the kind of things that I'm interested in. It's a very serious um, uh, problem. So um, in this work, I've involved students, uh, undergraduate and graduate students, in mapping the city, in doing archival research, and in doing oral histories with leaders, um, especially in Ward 7. And it's led us to propose abolition as a pragmatic ethic for theorizing climate and environmental justice in the district. We draw on oral histories with leaders such as Ward 7 Bruce Purnell, who has comes from a long lineage of abolitionist ancestry and who is at the front lines of mutual aid, restorative justice, and non-police de-escalation. Originally funded by AU's Metropolitan Policy Center in 2015 and featured on NPR and other venues, my work on housing and climate justice in the district is now also informing an NSF grant called Recipes, um, which I serve on with my colleague, Professor Garrett Grady Lovelace, um, and, and which is studying the interrelated crises of food surplus, food waste, and food insecurity in the US. I'll just put up here a third project. I'm not going to talk about it in the interest of time because I do want to move to a question, which is how has ARPC supported and how can it support my work in the future? But I am working on a, a kind of transnational understanding of the political ecologies of racial capitalism, thinking about um, caste and the long history of racial capitalism and colonialism. Um, and here are some, some things that have come out of it, including a keynote talk um, and, a, and a recently edited book out this month with Rutledge, Rethinking Difference in India Through Racialization. So as you can see, my work on environmental and climate justice goes beyond civil rights law and US-centric liberal legalism. It grounds EJ in the politics of brand, land, racialization, um, and capital. And, um, and, and so that sort of brings me to what I really value about ARPC's ethos and mission, which are, which are two things in particular. Um, one is the, uh, the, the sort of framing of racism in a kind of transnational context. I think this is really important and a way in which we can distinguish ourselves in the sort of internationalist looking um, um, theory building, um, also solidarity work that ARPC is kind of committed at, um, to doing is really inspiring. So an example of this was a seminar series called Thinking Freedom from the Global South organized by Professor Irene Kalis um, in CRGC, um, which really brought together indigenous scholars, um, you know, working in the North American Caribbean context, as well as uh, po post-colonial scholars working in the global South. Extraordinarily um, inspiring and just really sort of made me very excited about, about the work the center is doing and connecting with my work. The second is really how I started, is a feeling of belonging to an intellectual community that doesn't have to explain its existence. It's not a, only about these sort of feel good DEI activities, but it's rather about nuancing, internationalizing, and expanding anti-racist critique and action. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ranganathan. And I think that that was such an incredibly um, rich example of, you all saw that moment where I was talking about race and carcerality and then switched and said actually abolition. So our work this year, our everything, our public events, all of our programming this year is centering around two themes, one of which is reproductive justice and one of which is race and carcerality, um, which I think, given the moment, I think both of those themes as sort of urgent themes make sense. But our working groups are a little bit more focused. Our working groups are thinking about um, these questions that are really bringing together AU scholars in particular ways. And one is about race and reproductive politics writ large. So thinking not just about actual biological reproduction or procreation or reproductive rights, but thinking about reproductive labor, thinking about sexuality, thinking about gender-based violence. And the other on abolition, my hope is that it will bring together the numerous scholars we have on this campus who are thinking about what is and is not useful about abolition as a category, not only in the realm of the carceral, but in the realm of all kinds of issues, 
labor, agricultural justice, climate justice, and the environment. And so one of the things I'm hoping you'll see come out this year is some really interesting ideas from scholars like Professor Ranganathan who are thinking abolition in any number of ways at the same time. But on that topic of race and carcerality as one of our really key areas, I have the pleasure and privilege of introducing Professor Talisa Carter, who is another one of our affiliates, who is a who is dedicated to understanding the interactions of criminological theory, criminal justice organizing, and race. She's an assistant professor, though up for tenure this year, is that right? Next year. Next, oh, sorry, I'm not trying to rush you. Um, in the Department of Justice, Law, and Criminology at American University, and is an affiliated scholar of the Urban Institute, a non-resident fellow with the Brookings Institute, and an affiliate for the Center for Advancing Correctional Excellence at George Mason University. And I do want to also say that, you know, Dr. Carter is in the School of Public Affairs, but even from way over on the you know, other side of the quad, in my one year here, I have also heard about how you are not simply a phenomenal researcher with a new NIH grant that's starting this year, in fact, but also a phenomenal teacher um, whose students find her to be an incisive analyst and explainer of all things about race and carcerality. So with no further ado, Professor Carter. Okay, so I'm a walker, so I try. I'm, I'm gonna walk, um, that, that has to happen. All right, quickie work. So um, that's me. Um, so I appreciate Sarah for the bio. I appreciate your presence in this room today. I appreciate my colleagues, those who have spoken before me. Thank you for warming it up. And those who will come after. I am Dr. Carter, I'm in the School of Public Affairs. And what often gets uh, kind of caught up in my, thank you so much. What often gets caught up in my bio is that I used to be a correctional officer, right? So um, we can talk about that during the reception, how that happened. Um, but all three of my degrees are in the same thing. I'm a criminologist, right? And um, I used to be a correctional officer and that has absolutely impacted my work. Not only me as a person, right? You hear this voice, right? You see that authority just coming right through. Right? Not only as me as a person, but also, right, what I expect from research. Right? I, I went to graduate school after working um, in corrections, in a jail, supervising um, men in lockdown, the whole administra se administrative segregation, and also females of different statuses. And when I got in front of books again, I was disappointed. What is this? Right? <laughs> what exactly is this? Because it doesn't translate. And that failure has pushed me to Brookings. It's pushed me to Urban, and it's pushing me here to the anti-racism. Research Center. I'm also um, from New York. I say that because I talk fast, I know, excited about questions, and the accent will never go away. <laughs> All right, let's 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 go. So first um, project I want to talk about, I'll walk you through three um, that I'm doing right now on my way to tenure. The first being The Thin Brown Line. That's a tentative title of my first solo manuscript um, that will be published through NYU, right? And essentially, this is about accountability right, um, and institutional racism in the criminal justice system. So we know, right, and adultly students enter classrooms and they think they know about race and crime, right? They think they know about kind of, it's unfortunate black and brown people are incarcerated at disproportionate rates. And this is super un unfortunate, but there's so much that they don't know, right? And also in this conversation about criminal justice and racism, we don't really understand how accountability works effectively particularly in, when it comes to corrections, right? We've heard about rotten apples, right? Firing bad cops, bad officers, bad probation officers, right? We've heard about rotten barrels, but the argument I'm making here is that the whole forest is rotten, right? So well, the research questions for that work is what factors influence accountability and how does race impact praise and punishment? So that's another thing we don't talk about. Accountability is not only punishment, it's also praise. And praise in organizational literature is the most effective way to make people change behavior, right? It's not punishment. So this kind of whole premise by which the criminal justice system is founded on is flawed in essence, right? But I take it, of course, having been a correctional officer, I take it from an employee perspective. So how are employees held accountable? What is the role of the institution in perpetuating racism? Right, and so as a theorist, 
I put forth the institutional response model of social control, which essentially says that we can predict how organizations will punish or praise employees. We can predict it. And it's that prediction that perpetuates racism that we see, right? These disparate outcomes. And so that's um, original mixed methods data. Um, I'm in prison all the time, right? Um, but the findings are essentially that race matters, right? And so correctional officers that are black or brown are punished more severely than their counterparts. Right? And this plays out, right, in terms of realities for incarcerated folks, right? And so it's a rotten forest. Again, rather than the apple of the barrel, the forest needs to be evaluated. Project two, all in, right? Um, and I appreciate you, Sarah, for bringing up this um, study that's funded by the National Institutes of Health and particularly NIDA, right? Um, it's recently funded. I am, haven't taught this year at all, even though I miss my students terribly, right? That's the quickest affirmation we get, right? When someone gets it in the classroom. So the study is called All In, Diversity, Organizational Stress and Buy-In Among MAT Staff and Justice Populations. So essentially what this is about is as we push towards rehabilitation, right? As we push the system away from, right? This punitive model to this restorative model, do folks buy it, right? Are employees on the same page, right? Do employees believe in the changes and innovations that are happening in the system? This time I look in particularly at how, um, residents or incarcerated folks who suffer from opioid addiction, how they're treated behind bars. So the research questions is how does diversity impact staff buy-in, right? And how does organizational stress, which we know exists, impact staff buy-in, right? So this is a qualitative study, ambitious end of 160. Um, I'm currently at 50, working with a team of five AU students, both um, undergraduate and graduate students, Race matters already, preliminary qualitative data analysis, right? And um, the translational impact of that will be to develop training and policy suggestions for the sites that we're working with. Final, all right, shades of justice. Well, this is my baby, this is my AU baby because this study actually was birthed in the classroom, right? And so really what happened was I was teaching introductory criminology, I was teaching critical issues of justice, right? And what I was finding is, Yes, students want to work for the criminal justice system, but black and brown students don't want to be prosecutors. They want to be defense attorneys, right? And so I started noticing this and then I started noticing that maybe everybody wants to be a lawyer, but the darker my students were, the less they, the, the further away they went from prosecution, right? And so skin tone matters in these really interesting ways. And so this study, Shades of Justice, it explores the um, intersection between skin tone and criminal justice system perceptions of aspiring practitioners, right? It started right here on this campus. And so the questions, how does skin tone relate to motivations to work in the criminal justice system or their perceptions of the criminal justice system? We're pushing to diversify law enforcement, diversify these groups, but dark skinned people don't wanna do it, right? <laughs> And what are the implications of that? What are the implications of diversifying, but you're only diversifying for light-skinned folk, right? That's not really diversity. How do language and nonverbal cues reflect one's comfort with race and racism? And so this project is a mixed methods um, project. I did a survey across the United States to about 32 institutions, right? Um, about 600 at the end, a little bit higher, and then 100 Zoom interviews. Um, again, that was a team of 12 AU students, undergraduate to doctoral level, did those interviews over the summer of 2020. Findings is that race matters. Once again, everybody wants to work, right, in the system, but only certain people want to do certain things, and skin tone matters there, right? And so the translational impact is recruitment and retention. Again, we're saying we need to diversify, but what does that really look like? So the connections. Apologies for the S, not sure what happened. But my expectations for my interaction with the Anti-Racism Research Center is community, thought partnership, mentorship, as I'm still trying to get tenure, right? Um, <laughs> affirmation, which is huge because believe it or not, um, a lot of people don't believe um, the Academy is ready to have conversations about colorism. We hardly got race together, right? And so being in spaces like this affirm new research, new ideas, right? things that are different and obviously practical advancement. I appreciate your time. I think 
as a room of a number of academics, I think we all should just acknowledge how very impressed we are at how our colleagues um, are acting out their ethics of collaboration by like actually paying attention to time. Thank you all very much. It, it, I know I gave you an incredibly hard task. Um, I don't know if I could do it. Our third speaker, um, Elizabeth Rule, is also an assistant professor. Um, it's Dr. Elizabeth Rule, who's an enrolled citizen of the Chickasaw Nation and an assistant professor of critical race, gender, and culture studies here at AU. Uh, professor Rule has two forthcoming monographs. The first, Reproducing Resistance, Gendered Violence and Indigenous Nationhood, and the second, Indigenous DC, Native Peoples, and the Nation's Capital. Um, professor Rule is an a remarkable example of what we mean when we say that the work that ARPC seeks to do is intersectional and relational in its focus, not only on thinking about gender based violence, but decoloniality and dispossession, as well as indigenous justice and reproductive politics. So with no further ado, that's Elizabeth Roll. All right. Is everyone able to hear me? Is the mic working? All right. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, uh, first of all, for the invitation to be here today. I'm very excited to share a little bit about my research with you all. Um, but I want to start off first and foremost by thanking my colleagues um, and the coalitions at AU that have built a scholarly community dedicated to addressing these intersectional and systemic issues um, that have already been mentioned. I'm very, very delighted to be an affiliate faculty with the ARPC and very excited for what's to come um, upon this launch. Of course, we wouldn't be able to do that without our senior leadership support. So thank you all as well. And I'd like to extend, um, of course, a special welcome to students from my class, American Dreams, American Lives. Uh, welcome. <laughs> I'm sure you're able to see already the intersectionality at work here on campus and are seeing how all these facets come together to shape our American dreams and American lives. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about two different research projects. Oh, all right, that I'm working on at the current moment. Um, the first is on Indigenous DC, and the second is focused around gender based violence. I'll tell you a little bit more about each one. So the first project um, is called the Guide to Indigenous DC, which is a mobile application and digital mapping project that seeks to highlight sites of indigenous significance here in our nation's capital. In this project, I'm really interested in looking at mapping as a way to reclaim our narrative as indigenous peoples. So what do I mean when I say that, right? Of course, here in the district, right? Uh, we hold a particular significance as the capital of the settler state, right? Um, but even when we think about a place that's as iconic as Washington, D.C., indigenous peoples, the first Americans, the original inhabitants of that, this land, are left out of that narrative, right? I'm also interested in defending our stories as indigenous people. And what I mean when I say that is this project is deeply invested in bringing forth indigenous voices, centering indigenous forms of knowledge, and making sure that these stories that are often erased by colonial narratives, right, around the development of the nation state are brought to the fore so that people in the public are able to access this knowledge and use it to inform their positionality, the way that they engage with this space, and walk upon or live and work in this land known as Washington, D.C. <laughs> and finally, I'm interested in mapping as a way to decolonize our future. Now, definitely in all of my classes, we talk about decolonization and are careful to not use that as a metaphor. So I want to be very clear that when I'm talking about decolonizing our future, one of the things I'm interested in with this digital mapping project is bringing forth and projecting stories, right, and knowledge that will advance indigenous futurity. This is a little bit of what you'll see in the interface to the Guide to Indigenous DC. And this is also being expanded right now into a full-length manuscript that's coming out March 1st with Georgetown University Press. And the title of that text is Indigenous DC, Native Peoples and the Nation's Capital. I'm also very pleased to say that this project has recently been expanded 
due to the very warm feedback and reception it has received. And so now I'm operating with a larger umbrella project called the Guide to Indigenous Lands Project. Under that, um, in this past year, I've developed two additional Guide to Indigenous Lands, uh, digital maps and mobile applications. The first is for our neighbor to the north, Baltimore, and the second is for the state of Maryland as a whole. Both of these were carried out with you know, partnerships with other scholars, uh, government affiliates, and um, indigenous communities, of course, in the area. My second project departs in some ways from this indigenous DC work by taking up a transnational approach, looking at the United States and Canada in an investigation around the intersection of reproductive justice and gender-based gender violence as it affects indigenous women. But the thread binding the two, right, are the themes of colonialism, decoloniality, and how land matters to Indigenous people and to these projects as a whole. So I want to provide a, a brief content warning. My work focuses on very distressing subject material as it relates to the experiences of Indigenous women, girls, and Two-Spirit community members. You're able to see, for instance, some of these statistics on the screen. Um, even the first one I'll just read out is that the homicide rate affecting indigenous women is 10 times the national average. As I've been working on this project um, in, in my second full length manuscript, um, one of the questions that constantly comes up is, Dr. Rule, why? Why? Why is this number so high? Why are these rates of violence so disproportionate? Right? <laughs> and one of the answers here you can see on the bottom um, is that we have a toll of around 6,000 Indigenous women that have been marked as missing and murdered Indigenous women, but less than 1,000, far less than 1,000 of these are actually registered in something like a missing persons database. So we have a huge data gap issue. This affects our general understanding of this topic. And of course, until we understand it, we're not able to properly redress it. My work in this, in this text focuses on intersecting um, reproductive justice into this narrative of gender-based violence. So far, the scholarship has focused around these statistics, right? Sexual assault, homicide, um, Native women going missing, but we also have strong histories of violence in the reproductive justice arena as it relates to indigenous women. And so my thesis in my forthcoming text is really that until we understand reproductive injustice, right, as another form through which the colonial state has influenced its control and violence on native women's bodies, we won't be able to fully comprehend missing and murdered indigenous women as a plague of violence um, affecting both the United States and Canada. So thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. I'm right here at seven minutes. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to my next colleague. Um, but I'm really happy again to continue this conversation with anyone who's interested and continue building these relations across our university community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rule. Our fourth speaker, Dr. Ernesto Castaneda is an associate professor of sociology at American University here in DC, but is also the founding director of the Immigration Lab and very excitingly, the new director of the Center of Latin American and Latinx Studies, Latino Studies here. Dr. Castaneda's work is in international migration, borders, social movements, urban studies, ethnic and racial inequality, health disparities and homelessness. And I will say that we at ARPC are so thrilled to have such an accomplished scholar with such a commitment to this kind of work in practice, um, leading another center on campus to contribute to our ongoing collaborations across centers um, here at AU. Thank you very much, Sarah. In, indeed, looking for a lot of collaboration between our centers and, and it's great to be part of the ARPC too. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for the invitation. Uh, it's a tough act to follow these great colleagues uh, and our example that diversity is not uh, uh, against uh, excellence. We, we, we are witnessing it right now with my fantastic colleagues. So, AU is on the right again. And it's 
It's good to have uh, Rob Starr and, uh, and being uh, here and all the staff from the College of Arts and Sciences uh, showing the support for the center. That's really good to see. And it's great to have this space today to talk about uh, issues of race from the different creative and inspirational perspectives. Um, so with my students and I in the Immigration Lab, we have been uh, researching for years all the different benefits that migration has to the US. And again, this could apply to any country around the world. Uh, immigrants are net contributors to the economy, society, culture of the US. We can spend uh, a whole hour or more talking about it. There could be a museum dedicated to this. We're working on that uh, on, on the mall. Uh, we need immigrants to keep the economy growing. If they, we're going to have any population growth in the US, it's going to have to be to migration. Otherwise, we're going to see a decline and that is going to impact us all. Um, because uh, wages are not enough since the 70s, both parents in the household have to work to make ends meet. Uh, in many cities, then we need somebody to take care of our dishes, our gardens, and stuff like that. And who is doing that in the US, in London, in Paris, in, in Abu Dhabi? It's immigrants. So they're part of the economic system and it's a reality. So how can we improve the situation? Because they're improving our situation and our life, making it possible, right? So immigration to the US has a long history. We're a country of immigrants, but there were Native Americans here before. But even Native Americans are probably archaeologists tell us coming from Asia, maybe way, way back coming from Africa. So, and they were also moving across the continent, right? So the story of like, the foundation of Mexico City, Tenochtitlan is a story of people coming from Aztlan in the north and founding themselves in central Mexico. So even Native American people were always on the move and they were also migrants. And there were always these uh, interactions between different ethnic groups. So uh, unfortunately, nativism is also, uh, and has an old history in the world and in the US, and um, it leads us to immigrant restrictionism in our laws, in our history, but also today. I'm gonna give you some examples from that, and I think this is the place to do that. So for example, there's a quote here from uh, 1842 from a very respectful yeah. of the Anglo-Saxon. And this is kind of leading up to the, uh, to the war between Mexico and the US. And then we have another example around the US-Mexico war where um, Austin, Stephen Austin, the founder of Texas, says, a war of extremism is raging in Texas, a war of barbarism of despotic principles, principles <laughs> waged by the mongrel Spanish, Indian, and Negro race against the civilization of the Anglo-American race. So again, this is about foreign policy, it's about a war, but it's also framed by leaders uh, who have a city called after them in explicit racial terms. So again, it's, I didn't crack this, it's historical records. And then there's speeches given in Congress from a long time ago that also say these things, right? So for example, see here, uh, Cahoon from South Carolina says in Congress, our sirs is a government of a white race. The greatest misfortunes of Spanish America are to be traced to the fatal error of placing these color races on equality with the white race and basically intermixing that happens to all the Americas. So again, this white nationalism is not a problem that we have here today alone. It's been going on for, for centuries since the creation of this idea of race and, and slavery. Uh, of black people. And uh, then it's also related to the Chinese Exclusion Act, an act of Congress passed in effect for a long time, where it says explicitly in the middle, the coming of Chinese laborers to the United States will be suspended. And during such suspension, it should not be lawful for any Chinese laborers to come, or if they are here, basically we're gonna deport them. Again, US law, part of our history, and there were presidents to that, and this is applied to Japanese, and there's people working on that uh, historical record. Another example of this, uh, Hinman, a very uh, a person with a long career in Congress, in Connecticut, etc., he writes uh, in 1926. Two years ago, California came before this committee or the House of Representatives of the U.S. and stated herself in opposition to Chinese and Japanese immigrants and in favor of Chinese and Japanese exclusion. Stated that they wanted to develop a big white state in California, a white man's country. And now you come before us and want unlimited Mexican migration. I cannot see the consistency. So we're gonna be racist to all non-white, let's be racist to non-white, right? Why do we need Mexican labor? Well, they needed it for the mines and the trains, and et cetera, right? So uh, this contributed to the lynching of millions of uh, thousands of uh, Mexican Americans in the Southwest. And also um, this continues, right? So in 1930, there's uh, the, the, the mayor of, of San Francisco speaks explicitly on the record, not with his friends in a kind of behind doors, on the record about keeping California white. That was a racial project of a conquered land, right? So these leads, these are examples of racist policies, racist bills, racist speeches by elected politicians uh, that represented an ideology, right? 
So they are not just, again, uh, things that you comment to a friend or you say in, in, the, in the lockers. These have shaped immigration policy for centuries in the U.S. And again, this is also happening across many parts of the world. Uh, unfortunately, that's history, but that also controls the narrative today, I would argue. Anti-immigrant, eugenic groups and individuals have long financed immigrant restrictionist groups in DC and elsewhere. I could name them, they are think tanks, they are quoted and, and looked for by journalists all over the place, and you heard their arguments. I don't want to give them any free publicity, so I don't name them, but again, I'm not making them up, I could give you uh, their addresses and everything. Uh, they are well represented in web searches, media mentions, quotes in my migration classes, people will come and write uh, papers for the class, and they'll cite these, these, these sources as facts about migration. Uh, but they are people that are openly eugenic, uh, racist, founding these centers uh, of our immigration research. Uh, politicians think wrongly that immigration, that immigrant bills and policies that are pro-migrant are political suicide because of the anti-immigrant lobby and the loud voice in the public sphere. But they're actually, poll after poll after poll shows that the American public, whether they are Democrats, independents, uh, Republicans, they're in favor of immigration reform, DACA. Actually, this is just a group that has control of policy making in Washington, but it doesn't represent the American public. It's a minority of a minority, but it has a big hold in the Republican Party, but also in the other one. Um, so anti-immigrant views are often attainted by racism, historically and today. The arguments are not often explicitly racist, but the assumptions behind our common sense uh, and the terms of debate are, are racist. What am I talking about? Examples and ideas that are very powerful, hegemonic, we will say, like uh, immigration restrictionism uh, has become the norm. Seeing some immigrants, asylum seekers, and refugees as more valuable or, or deserving than others is, again, making a discrimination between different groups of people. We see Ukrainians versus Ethiopians, for example. A state should be able to control their borders and know who is coming in and where they live. This is something that we hear politicians say time and time again. Uh, and then we believe that it's important for the state to have a legible population, right? The nation state with a racially homogeneous population or a shared culture or language is something that in school, elementary school, we are taught that that should be the norm, that the nation state, like the, the great France of the revolution, had one people, one language, one culture. That's never been the case historically anywhere in the world. There's always been diversity. But we have this idea that people believe that you should have a nation of people that are the same because you are doing it for your people. You are, it's, it's the moral right thing to do. That's very dangerous and it's very common. So um, to conclude, I'll just say that today's immigrant and refugee exclusion is part of a long history of division and exploitation along categorical lines. Some of the quotes that I mentioned uh, uh, before come from the first chapter of, of Building Walls, which came in paperback in 2021. And some of the stuff I talk about in this free article, Open Access, on, on the dangers of methodological nationalism and putting the nation state as the center of something real and borders of something that should be protected. Um, so I'm out of time. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Castaneda. And, but I wanted to say really quickly that one of the amazing things that you may have been noticing here is how many of our faculty are referencing their remarkable scholarship and their books and their articles. And I'm sure many of you are thinking, but how will I ever find them? Um, which, you know, you should be thinking that, right? Because we all should try to spend less money on Amazon. At least I'm trying to. Um, but I wanted to take this as a moment to plug a new initiative that ARPC is doing. And if you came to our student staff town hall earlier today, you heard a great deal about, but which we are incredibly excited about. ARPC is starting a lending, a free lending library um, in our building. And our lending library will include copies of anti-racist publications of literally a book length monographs by our affiliates um, it, that you will be able to check out as a member of this community for free and have access to. Um, you will be able to use these books. It will also include a set of texts that our faculty recommend as critical teaching texts for racial justice based scholarship. So if you would like to read any of these books that we are talking about that have come out recently or are coming out by hopefully the end of this semester, our lending library will be up and operational. You will be able to check out any of those books and our open access articles by particularly our scholars who work in article based fields will be available on our website. There will be a digital catalog. You'll be able to see what is available. And we look forward to having an opportunity to have you come into our office and to learn more about the remarkable scholarship of our faculty affiliates. Um, our next speaker, Sybil Robert, Sybil 
Williams is the Director of African American and African Diaspora Studies and the Program Director for Theater and Musical Theater in the Department of Performing Arts. She has spent the last 12 years cultivating her craft as a playwright and dramaturg, and is also, I'm pleased to announce, our inaugural Jackie and Richard Meisenberg Faculty Fellow this year for her exciting research project on women in Rastafari. I want to sing you a song of liberation. I want to tell you a story, a story about birthing and woman and Africa and art, making art, making my own life. Tanzania is where your story begins. It begins with a ritual, buying the cloth, Maisha Safari Kubwa. Life is a long journey. In Africa, theater is water, Seed, a sack of rice marked US government, a midwife, a condom, a ritual, a circle of women telling stories, a dance, ancient rhythms pounded into dusty roads. It is a dance of survival, our feet keeping time in two worlds. There's so much gone already. A child that could have been is gone. That daughter will never sing to me. And if I had it to do all over again, I would choose love without fear. We women circle, we give birth, we understand dying, we sit, eat, laugh, listen, make art. Tiny African knots cover my head, knotty fist raised in salute, shun comb, shun razor, shun reason. A woman takes my hand wrapped in red and black conga. She says, are you trying to be Rasta? She looks like my grandmother Hattie shining, wearing red. Her skin is smooth, polished ebony. My hand in her red palmed working hand, she runs her fingers through my hair and sings, no woman, no cry. And then she asks, do you know any prayers? I am a woman searching, searching. I look at this woman and I am staring in the face of God a simple black woman sitting in the dust. That is my work. My work is to go into indigenous communities and to sit with the members of that community, to listen, to learn, to live, to build houses from earth and wood, to make food and to build art. I learned this in Tanzania. I learned to go into villages, to knock, or not knock, to go up to people and ask, and to ask if I may be a part of your life. And if I may be a part of your life, will you make art with me? And if you will make art with me, how will that change you? How will it change me? What do you want the world to know about you? What do you want to know about me? There were no audiences. It was just people making art, rehearsing for the revolution, building a world that would make all of us better. And I learned to do that in Tanzania, East Africa. I came back here and 10 years later did it at Howard University when I went and lived with MOVE, the MOVE community in Philadelphia, the community that experienced the first bombing by air in 1981. And we made art and we did it to free Mumia Abu-Jamal. And there were no audiences. There were just practitioners. We staged the play as a rally. I interviewed Mumia. On death row, we exchanged correspondence. That correspondence became the basis of a text. That text became the basis of performance. And every night, we invited a new activist in to speak to the audience about the death penalty and other kinds of issues facing Black radical groups. That was my work. I am pleased to note that every student who was in that cast, and there are about 12 of them, are still doing that work. Mm -hmm. Here at AU, I teach a course called African Art as Politics, and I am going to take a group of students to South Africa to work with my partner, Dr. Mandisi Sindhu, who is doing the same kind of work I do in South Africa, and I hope that they will have the same experience that I do, that they will learn how to make 
theater for survival, not for entertainment. This work that we do is to allow us to explore and engage our humanity at the deepest level. When someone is making theater, when you can see yourself on stage, when you can see parts of yourself that are not readily accessible, you are made whole. My theater is to make people whole. And so I want to go into the Rastafari community, sit with them, listen to them, learn from them, bring them to this campus so that they can say, all black women are beautiful. That job, that work comes from a discussion that began in my class too about colorism and beginning to think about what Rastafari has consistently offered the world in terms of mapping and conscientizing Africa on the physical body, from locks to head wraps to tall skirts. What has it done? How does it give us a different way of thinking about being? Not to mention ITAL Liberty, right? Which teaches us about sustainable diet and eating, which nobody gives the Rastas credit for. Thank you very much, Rasta. And to think about how Rasta begins to have us consider ideas about international community and Pan-Africanism in, in the 21st century context within now, particularly the way in which women are forming international alliances. So that is the work that I want to do and will do. Thank you, ARPC. I will begin or continue that work of engaging the Rasta community here at AU and in Grenada, South Africa, and Jamaica. Thank you so much. So I can't resist the asides because I, our, our, our faculty do so much work for what that I could never put on my own PowerPoint presentation. But I think one of the things that we see so amazingly in Professor Williams's work are the ways in which ARPC in its new vision and mission understands structural change to operate in ways that exceed policy making. It's not to say that writing policy is not a crucial and important task that we take on, that shifting legislature, that affecting what Congress does and what's happening in our courts, who gets appointed to our courts, is not crucial, vital political labor. And that's, I think, part of what you'll see in some of our working groups and panels this year. But it's to also say that we believe that cultural shifts are absolutely essential for structural political change. And that until we take seriously the multiple forms of knowledge production that operate in and outside of the academy, that include not simply structural knowledge, not simply policy, not even what happens only in the archive, though I do love an archive myself, <laughs> I will confess, I love an archive, but that also we understand embodied knowledge we understand cultural production, we understand the experience and activism of generations of grassroots movements as producing vital knowledge toward racial justice, that we cannot have the kind of holistic research center that we need to have. And so what we see with the inclusion of arts and racial justice as one of our key areas of focus is our attempt to begin to think about the different ways in which knowledge is produced, yes, but also the ways in which structural change is made possible. And part of that happens through cultural shifts and new cultural discourses. So with that said, I'd like to introduce our, our next speaker, Sarah Tremba, who is an editor, writer, and professorial lecturer in the Writing Studies Program, a Dean's DEI Fellow in the College of Arts and Sciences, and a member of the Writing Studies Program and Library Joint Committee on Liber information literacy and a doctoral candidate in the School of Education's Leadership and Policy Program. Um, Sarah Trembeck has done us an incredible honor by joining our faculty advisory committee along with actually several other people on this panel in fact to kind of raise your hand if you have importuned you to join our faculty advisory committee um, and will be leading our new educational initiatives this year along with um, professorial lecturer Amara Jaquir. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Lily. Um, I'm really honored to be amid such brilliance. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And thank you all for coming. 
Um, so I wear a lot of hats here at AU, but I am here as a student today. When I turned 50, for some reason, I decided I need to go back to school. <laughs> and, and here I am, um, a doctoral candidate. And so today I'm going to talk about my research. So I'm actually a little bit uncharacteristically nervous. I don't usually talk about my work. I talk about other people's work, but here I go. Um, I thought I would start by invoking uh, some of the work of the scholars who, when I was my own student's age, really uh, played a role in raising my critical consciousness and helping me become a critical thinker about race. And um, those would be France Fanon and Gugiwa Thiango and Amy Césaire, the, the, the um, decolonizers of the 50s and 60s. Um, a lot of the work that they did had to do with what they called decolonizing the mind, that the, that the colonial structures of the world had taken a toll on our spirits and on our souls and on our psychology. And the work that they did was to help undo that. And that's the work that I hope to continue with my doctoral research. But I also had to like, because I'm an editor, I had to do that and call it also decolonizing the mind, right? Because we're not, I'm not just, wanting to raise consciousness and improve critical thinking among people who um, inherited uh, colonialism as survivors of it, but people who inherited the privilege of the perpetrators of it, that my work hopefully uh, releases uh, people from both of those things to whatever extent I can. This is, the, <laughs> this is the title of my dissertation. And I think if I explain the title, you'll get the whole picture. Um, it's called Delinking High School Graduates from the Colonial Matrixes of Power that Shape U.S. History and Current Events Narratives, a Tool to Build Critical Reading Skills in Those Who Are Open and Online. <laughs> um, so I prefer this one. Um, but, but what that means is that I'm building a digital tool that I hope can sort of replicate what I am able, I think, to achieve in my classrooms. Uh, when I work with my students, I have four months with them, right? And I can take them from point A to point B in helping them attain critical reading skills that will help them recognize cultural biases and hopefully take the steps to correct them, right? That my students are continually being inundated with narratives that have um, subtext of white supremacy or that omit things that are diverse, right? Um, especially their social studies textbooks and their history textbooks from high school. So when I get them in my classroom and they're writing papers for me on things that have relevance, cultural relevance in terms of cross-cultural communications or whatever, a lot of times they don't have the information base to speak on those things, but they speak anyway, right? <laughs> because they're being asked to, and because they've been educated in a way that says, you know what, just write anyway, you got 30 minutes and you're gonna have to get this score on this test, right, if you wanna get into college. Um, so I'm working with high school, uh, with creating a tool for high school graduates. I don't specify first year college students, even though that's who I work with, because I want my work to be relevant to people who are outside the academy as well. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that I'm finding in my research is that uh, it's not just about the text or even the text and the student, that systems are involved in keeping these things in place. Um, that's one of the reasons why I want to create something that's extra systemic. Um, so I started this work because I'm an editor and because I'm a critical rhetorician and because I'm a writer and a writing teacher, I started just looking at text. Like, what is going on, right? I thought we were past the multicultural era. What is going on that my students in 2020 or 2010 don't know more than they know? So I started collecting social studies textbooks, like being the, the dork that a lot of us are in the academy. I, I started collecting social studies textbooks and reading them. And I found that the same racist narratives that were perpetuated in previous generations were perpetuated in subtler ways. Right, that the things that you can't say, like you can't say Indians are savage, <laughs> right? Like you can't say that nowadays, but you can suggest it with images. You can suggest it by what you leave out, by where you start stories and uh, any number of other things that fall in my field in the category of critical reading. Okay, so um, what I learned to help my students do in my first year classes is to read critically and to ask questions. And for most of them, that is drastically different than they were indoctrinated in high school. They were told, you know, you, you gotta take this test, you gotta get this grade, and I, as the teacher, I'm gonna tell you what to say on it. 
Um, it's really interesting work because it's very emotional work for a lot of students, which makes it emotional work for me, right? <laughs> like um, when the, the work that I'm doing right now, uh, which will turn into the actual research that I do for my dissertation is that I'm taking a chapter from a book, um, a very widely used high school history textbook that's on the founding of Jamestown <laughs> Colony, which is really just the best one to use because it's got so many things that so many publishers do so wrong. Um, and I com I'm comparing it to the work of scholars, um, indigenous scholars who are also historians, uh, Nancy Eisenberg, who writes White, wrote White Trash, I hope you're familiar with that book, right, who talks about the origins of the white working class. Um, Jack Forbes is the name of the indigenous scholar and uh, different scholars on racism, and I'm comparing them, showing what possibly could or should be in the book that my students are reading, and we're finding all of the things that are off about it. Um, but when their frustration comes up, that's cognitive dissonance, right, and that becomes a pedagogical concern, right? Like when students are frustrated, they're, you're showing them something that they've never learned before, right? And they get angry, right? Or they turn off, they don't want to hear it. Um, or some, I've had quite a few students bust out crying, right? Some people are very sad because the history that is being suppressed is a very difficult history, right? In the literature, it's called hard histories, right? Um, so as I was studying this and learning how to teach it, I began to see how many systems were involved in keeping it in place, the publishing industry, politics, um, the test making industry. But I also started to look at why it really matters, right? We don't want people to be racist. But what I was also uh, beginning to learn through studying this work is that it actually uh, changes how people participate in democracy, that a lot of researchers have found that when people can't understand history properly, or they can't think critically about it, that they don't make informed decisions in the democracy itself, right? So as we see politicians getting involved in suppressing historical um, information <clears throat> and critical thinking about it, excuse me, thank you, <clears throat> uh, we realize that they know exactly what they're doing. Um, so. My theory is based on the work of Paolo Freire and his theories on raising critical consciousness, but also of my um, of my field of rhetoric and composition, <clears throat> where all those reading strategies <laughs> that I spoke of come from. Um, I also feel as though it has to be taken outside of the system because it's an emergency right now. What I was looking to do originally with first year students was to happen in the academy, right? Like, how can I be a better teacher? How can I raise critical consciousness? But as rights are being taken away legally, right? Like several states um, <clears throat> are saying that you cannot talk about race, <laughs> right? That you, <laughs> that you can't say that racism is systemic which is just strikes me as wildly uh, anti-democratic, but um, it seems to me as though people need to be able to take their educations into their own hands. So I've been looking at programs like Noom and Lumosity and Calm and all those um, online digital tools where people can re-educate themselves to uh, any number of things. And some of them are really, very successful. I think Lumosity claims to have 100 million users, and that's what I'm going for. So <laughs> I'm just, just going to make it happen. <laughs> but I want to leave you with a quote by Carter G. Woodson, um, who is one of the people who started this work a century ago. And his work <laughs> is brilliant as you read it, but you think, man, have we, things really not changed since 19. 32, uh, but this is a quote from the a Miseducation of the Negro. He wrote, philosophers have long conceded that all people have two educations, that which is given to them, such as in schools, and the other that they give themselves. Of the two kinds, the latter is by far the more desirable. Indeed, all that is most worthy in people, they must work out and conquer in themselves. It is that which constitutes our real and best nourishment, what we are merely taught seldom nourishes the mind like that which we teach ourselves. So hopefully I'll be building a tool to help people be able to do that. Thank you. And our very last speaker, this is, can I just um, say that I am blown away by our scholars. 
Uh, one of the things we wanted to do today was to actually provide you a range of the type of faculty that we work with and the scholars that we work with. We didn't want a panel of just, you know, the, you know, full professors with the endowed chair and yadi body yadi, right? Though those are exciting things, um, don't get me wrong. But if, you know, Peter, if you'd like to give me a full professorship and a chair in anything that starts with anything, I would not turn it down. Um, but I, I think one of the things that we, when we talk about what it means to do scholarship and research toward racial justice and to have a center like this, and we talk about the idea that part of what we are doing is trying to practice the political ethics, the sort of anti-racist and intersectional political ethics that we are seeking to produce in the world around us. And part of what that means is that we have to recognize all of the different areas within the academy out of which knowledge is produced and to upend some of the presumptions that um, it is that things like rank or things like um, whether, you know, where you are in your degree process or things like tenure line or non-tenure line or inside or outside of the academy actually determine our capacity to produce valuable and critical knowledge. But if we are doing our job right as an institution, that part of what we can do is to seek, find, foster, and grow critical knowledge production and it's and to enable its impact on broad scale levels from our graduate students, from our faculty, from our term faculty and our tenure line, from our undergraduates, our community workers, our cultural producers. And that's part of what we seek to do is to convene all of those groups together to produce the kind of critical knowledge to produce the social transformation that we are seeking. And our last speaker, I will admit I had to twist her arm to get her on this panel, speaking of an ethics of like wanting to put everybody else out there first. Uh, Professor Willie, Willie Wong, in addition to being the Associate Director of Faculty Engagement and Initiatives at ARPC, is also an Associate Professor of Literature and Critical Race, Gender and Culture Studies, whose research focuses on the politics of affective labor, racial capitalism, minor transnational coalitional movements and media formations of trans-Pacific Chinese, Sinophone and Asian American communities. And after Professor Wong finishes speaking, for those of you on Zoom especially, we will be moving into the Q&A. So it's a great time to put your questions in there and someone here will read them. Thank you so much, Lily. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for staying. I'm so excited to be a part of this talk about convening and building off of lineages of brilliance. I'm just so humbled to, to be a part of this group and to be in community and to do this work alongside just, you know, amazing leadership and vision. Um, so hello, everyone. For those who, not, who don't know yet, I'm Lily Wong. Um, so my work, like what Sarah said, um, focuses on issues of affective labor. So basically kind of care work, sex work, in, works of intimacies. Um, and I look at look at it specifically around minor transnational coalition movements, specifically around the Asia Pacific in the 20th century onward. And so this goes into uh, my first book, which focuses on trans-Pacific creative networks and cultural productions, mobilized specifically around trans-Pacific movements for sex work decriminalization. Now. It traces the ways transnational representations and mobilizations of the figure of the so-called Asian sex worker has actually long operated as a trope for both Asian American sexuality and Asian modernity, right? So it constitutes a pivotal reflection on the intersectional politics, not only of racial, sexual, and class structures, but also that between America, Asia and the Americas, right? This is things that our fellow faculty panelists have already started touching on. And so for tra transparency, a large reason why I got into this work was uh, because of my parents. Uh, they were academics and labor rights advocates organizing in Taiwan since the 1990s, specifically around issues of sex work decriminalization as it's tied to histories of militarization in the carceral state. Um, and so my work started off as an attempt to find continuance, right, to find, to extend the organizing work that I witnessed growing up, really admired and really wanted to figure out how to continue to build that. Um, and the way I answered that question was to kind of think through questions about, expansive questions about cultural production, going to Sarah's point, right, like what, what can culture do in relationship to this work that I see so many people laboring over for, for generations and uh, generations, right. 
So the book traces then the discursive work done through movement building, but also through cultural representation and the creation of cultural networks um, and analyzing its material effects, right? That culture has material effects in them on a larger trans-Pacific scale. And so this kind of, this idea of the trans-Pacific is where I hold on to as I try to uh, kind of work through what we mean by the Trans-Pacific in my following book anthology that I'm co-editing with uh, Christopher Patterson and UBC and Jinting Lin from National Central University of Taiwan. This is where, going to kind of Sarah's earlier point in the earlier panel, we really want to decenter North American cultural production and knowledge production around the Pacific, center Pacific Islanders, center questions about Oceania, but also center questions and knowledge production that's coming out of Asia. Um, and so the anthology brings together interdisciplinary scholars, activists, and practitioners across the Pacific who seeks to approach the Trans-Pacific not as a stable discipline or descriptor, it's not a thing, right? But as an activating and problematizing methodology, which creates critical pathways across discipline, particular, particularly between, let's say, Asian American studies, ethnic studies, indigenous studies, studies on Oceania, critical refugee studies, labor and migration studies, and inter-Asia cultural studies. We as a collective of thinkers maintain that Asianic racial form has historically mediated the contradictions between US racial capitalism and its imperial military project. That's to say that Asianic racial formation has long created and maintained in and across the Pacific to mediate and obscure the connection between domestic race exclusion in imperial centers like the US, but not exclusively of the US, to the military and imperial expansions abroad. So our work is then to trace these linkages that have often been invisibilized, to trace what Lisa Lowe calls the link to if um, uneven intimacies of four continents, right? Um, that have always already concretized our material condition. Right. Um, and then with that, I actually also want to hold a little space. And I, I'm sorry that, you know, my my slides are a little bit off, but um, this should be actually in black. Um, I wanted to hold space for the amazing artists, the D local DC of artist Shama Coover, uh, Shama Coover, who, uh, you know, whose work raised the cover of my first book, um, but also graced the, the, the website of our Asia Pacific diaspora program here at CRGC, and also gracing the cover of my next, oh, all the colors are, are off, I'm so sorry, um, but also graced the cover of my next uh, publication that will be coming out next week, oh, well, next, not, next month, sorry, I wish it was next week. Um, this special issue, uh, co-edited by uh, UT Austin Professor Eric Tong on dimensions of violence, resistance, and becoming Asian Americans and the opening of the COVID era. Um, and one of the pivotal points of contemplation at the core of the issue was the spring 2021 murders of Asian massage parlor workers in Atlanta and how it brought to the fore a long history of sexualized racialization of Asian sex work and care work as well as its convergence with empire and state-sanctioned violence within the U.S. and global context, right? So it prompts the question as Dylan Rodriguez asks, quote, what if anti-Asian violence is not reducible to hate and is in fact a persistent, unexceptional presence in the long historical civilizational terror-making machine that is the United States? So the Rodriguez question really recontextualizes interpersonal hate in relation to racial capitalist violence, including policing and militarization through the structuring forces of US empire. And so this question really keeps on coming back as I seek continuance in my own current work um, through the center in my own research, but also in and out of academia, right? I really seek to further connect the anti-violence efforts in North America to the ongoing work on sex work and migrant labor justice in Asia and Pacific, which I discussed in my first book and in the, and the book anthology that I'm working on right now. I'm trying to think through the trans-Pacific impacts, for instance, of Taiwan-based organizations such as COSWAS, the Collective of Sex Workers, Sex Workers and Supporters, and TIWA, Taiwan International Workers Alliance, which have continually mobilized internationalist coalitions against not only US militarism, but also its overlapping and symbiotic ties with Japanese and Chinese imperialism and ethno-nationalisms altogether. 
So recollecting historical if obscured links and movements against carceral systems and state sanctioned violence across North America, Taiwan, Hong Kong, South Korea, the Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, and the Pacific Islands actually allows us to decenter land-based and nation-based movement logics. Dwelling on such potential connections, I argue, also pushes against the so-called new Cold War narratives, which A, historically exceptionalizes the current moment of US-China competition and militarization, obscuring coalitional openings if linked if uneven intimacies, citing Lisa Lowe, that have always already been in formation. So this trans-Pacific relational work towards ending violence structures specifically also my work building with organizations like AAPI Women's Lead, specifically serving as their social justice fellow over the summer and ongoing advisor for their community-driven research project, led by Executive Director Connie Wynn, who will actually be coming to the reception later on. Um, the project aims to bring together community-driven researchers from a wide span of organizations across the U.S. and U.S.-affiliated islands to collect and share the community's stories of racial and gender violence across ages and generations. Here, I'd like to hold space to acknowledge the work of AU alumni, Emily Park and Julia De La Fonte, who are part of the API Women's Lead team who have created convergences that have allowed for this collaboration. I would also like to note that this work also builds off of the amazing work of API Women's Lead EB Connie Wynn and uh, their work alongside AirPC's EB uh, Sarah Kaplan all the way 20 years ago, right, organizing through the Feminists of Color Coalition Insights across generations, right? So talking about building off of lineages of uh, brilliance, right, of political conviction that is seeking continuance today. As such, I am excited to be a part of ARPC team oh. <laughs> to help build Sarah's expansive vision of anti-racism, decoloniality, and intersectional justice. As an associate director of faculty, I'm thrilled to get a chance to work with you all, right? <laughs> to get to uh, find ways to support and amplify the incredible work, incredible work of scholars, students, practitioners, organizing locally uh, and beyond. Um, and, you know, this is the work that I see generations of folks doing and continue to do. And I'm just humbled to be a part of the work and to find continuance through that. So thank you, everyone. I don't think I've been to this kind of exciting in-person panel in quite a long time and been in the actual room. How really exciting. Let's give everyone a round of applause. And we have some time for Q&A, about 15 minutes. Um, and I'd love to open it up. Let's see who's in the room and has a question. And then we'll see who's on the computer that has a question. I I feel like I'm looking at like, you know, when you're doing the, the they used to have the telethons on the phone and you would have to see the people and be like, do we have a caller online? Here, do we have a caller on line three? No. Okay. Well, that's good because I actually do have a question. Um, I, I do. So, you know, I would love to actually do it this way. I'd like to sort of open the question to the panel and just have three of you be like, let's do it like Jeopardy, three of you be like, me, I want it. Um, but here's my biggest first question. So one of the things that we're seeing across this panel are the ways in which each of you are pushing beyond the sort of easy categorization of your work, right? There's sort of like a short term, we even gave each of you a term and we're like, you're talking about environmental justice, or you're talking about reproductive politics, but each of you, I think, are pushing. I'd love to hear each of you talk about why it is that thinking about race, and particularly thinking about race in the interest of racial justice, right, like this kind of anti-racist approach, requires moving beyond single category work for you. Why, why is it requiring you to push beyond a sort of a simple single category? Who wants to answer? Me. <laughs> Uh, all right, so really quick, this isn't working again, so I'm sorry. It is? All right, perfect. All right, so um, just always breaking things. So um, race and carcerality, I have to push, I push past race, is our understanding of race and crime by including color. Um, and I think that's super important because in the U.S. context, anytime you say race, we immediately get defensive or we become experts based on lived experience. And um, the divisions are very stark um, in a U.S. context. Colorism is different. 
because even if you're lighter skinned, high yellow, if you happen to be um, a, in, a, in a black community, if you tan, if you use an umbrella to hide your skin from the sun, um, it all it comes up for all of us. Color is something that I think hasn't been, particularly in the United States, hasn't been as harshly stigmatized as race in terms of crime, and therefore it makes a starting point on which we can move forward. Who else wants it? Are you, are you gesturing to Sarah? Okay. Yeah. Melanie, yes, perfect, yes, yes. Well, one of my favorite quotes, um, Audre Lorde, is that, you know, we don't live our lives in single issue ways, right? And so, and I might have gotten the wording a little bit wrong there, but that was definitely her idea. And so um, for me, it's imperative not only to move beyond taken for granted and received wisdoms um, around what even the environment is, right? Because for so long, the narrative on the environment as forest to be conserved or wildlife species to be conserved uh, completely forecloses uh, other types of ecologies and environments, notably, you know, uh, famous environmental justice scholars have said the environment is where we live, work, play, and go, grow old. And so to really think capaciously about these, these terms rather than in a narrow-minded way. We also know that we can't talk about, um, you know, environmental justice without carceral justice, without um, gender justice, right? Without housing justice, without food justice. And so it, it's, it, it's the intersectionality is not just about identities, but also materialities. Um, and so, you know, from, from a very sort of basic survival standpoint, we have to move beyond received categories, right? Not to mention from, you know, from the theoretical standpoint, we have to build theory from where people are at and not just impose things from the outside. I think there's another one down there. Yeah, there's more. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think I'm blurring boundaries in a couple different ways. Um, looking at, you know, the what I call the ideological and actual offspring of the colonized and the colonizers feels important to me because people are all victims of these false narratives, right? And because we all live in the same society. And again, it just strikes me as an emergency, right? I started the work as like activists were like, you know, chopping heads off of statues. And then there were, you know, the, the Tiki March in North Carolina, people were getting killed, activists are getting killed. I was like, wow, this is an emergency and it involves everybody. So it doesn't make sense to me to only look at one population. And the population I'm actually looking at in my research are people who have been indoctrinated, but who are open to new narratives. So I'm not even specifying race. I'm not, you know, it's, it's, I think the norm in research to say my demographic is this uh, class or this race or this geographic locality, but I'm looking at people with certain personality traits and educational experiences. So my research is taking a couple of different, and there's one of my professors back there, <laughs> Dr. Kakir. Um, my research is taking uh, a couple different steps so that I can find this population and then see if my intervention works on them. I also want to pick it up very quickly and just say that one of the things that I find sometimes limiting in a discussion about race is that it breaks everybody down into simple categories and or binaries. And within the African-American community, there are various cultural groups. And oftentimes we conflate race and culture. And I find that to be even more distressing because race and culture are distinct. They are not the same categories. So when I look at the groups of people I am interested in, move, Rastafari, um, even if I look at something like the um, new black African movement or the new African movement, I'm looking at people who have a particular way of viewing culture and ideology. They are African, black, African-American. Um, excuse me, their worldview marks them as a very distinct population. So I don't want us to get confused when we simply say race and then we flatten everybody out. And that's my concern. Awesome. Question in the room? No? Oh, yeah. 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 This is the division of labor between us. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, good afternoon. My name is Melanie Adams. I'm the director of the Smithsonian's Anacostia Community Museum. It's so exciting was all of your topics were so relevant to the communities that we serve in Southeast. And so my question is, how do we get to those communities and share your great work? So how do we make it community focused and bringing it to the people? Oh, such an excellent question. I'm so excited by that question. I'm like bouncing. Okay, who wants to start with this question? Does anyone want to start? Thank you. I'm from Southeast, so that and I, and I grew up right up the street from the museum. So I am glad that you are here. Thank you. One of the things that is happening there, I know I work with a theater company called Fresh. Um, that and there's also the Alliance Theater. So there are companies, there are, there are spaces where I think we as scholars might leave this academy and actually go into those spaces. And that is one of the things that I am working with the museum group here at AU to do, to bring people from perhaps your museum to our museum and to actually go and bring pieces that I may work with to your museum. I think it is imperative that I that we get out. I send students to the Alliance Theater. I send students to the Anacostia Arts Center because it is important that we are in community. I think the way we do it is literally to go into community. Um, and I'm speaking as an artist, like literally building productions in the community. And that is something that we have charged ourselves with here. Um, in the DPA at AU. So I would love to talk to you further, but that is one way I see it. Like literally leave here and go there and do the work. I'm gonna intervene here for one second and then I'm gonna let the panel, I really wanna hear what Elizabeth has to say and it's um, But But I wanna also stress, this is something that we are doing structurally within ARPC as well as you know, having our amazing faculty affiliates who are already doing this work, not only is this part of what we're doing in terms of some of the grants that we're incubating, in terms of trying to really foster grants and foster new projects that are doing part, like full partnerships with community-based organizations that are community-led, as opposed to that thing where you find some community organization and you bring it in at the tail end, so you have something on the page. But also things like our Polly Murray, Arts and Artist Residency, which is based at Stable Arts, right, which is a, com a local community-based art center and gallery space, which is going to be fostering, particularly bringing in artists who are based in the DC region and whose work is rooted in our communities. So these are the kinds of things that we are trying to do more and more, and these are where our community collaborations come in. When we talk about what it means to produce community collaborations that are sustainable, and that our community base, Melanie, it's exactly what we're talking about is the idea that this work is happening other places. And the one, I will say the one part of this launch that is happening not here, that you are not seeing, is the part of this launch that is for people we are inviting to be community partners. We've invited 30 organizations and grassroots movements to meet with us off campus at our community partner, Eaton, DC to have a round table about what does it mean to actually have community academic partnerships that are reciprocal, equitable, and sustainable. And we'll be having that event very soon. And those of you who are interested in being part of those collaborations, you can always reach out to me. But yeah, that's a non-academic event. Okay, Elizabeth? Sure. Um, thanks so much for coming and for your question. Okay. Um, I do work that specifically focuses on Washington, D.C. Um, and in my work, uh, which is a digital intervention into telling indigenous stories about this land, um, one of the things that I'm trying to accomplish is to intervene with the audience that sees D.C. in its capacity as the nation's capital, right? And so we're able to drill down and say, okay, if the, if Washington DC, if the district can become a symbol for the nation state, right? Even further still, we can have something like the National Mall become representative of DC. And so I'm trying to interrupt um, the way that we understand the narratives that we've attached to this place as the nation's capital as a symbol of colonial extension over the entirety of the space that's now contained within our country. The other component that I'm really interested in and thinking about is 
you know, in my writing, I often refer to these places as, you know, the land that we now understand to be Washington, D.C., right? Understanding that these are not static categories um, that are created and demarcated, um, but rather that they have evolved under a very particular, and in my investigations, violent regime of conquest and colonialism. And so I think when we're able to investigate together those two categories, right, the fact that we we tend to and want to think about this as a static place within a colonial framework, but also thinking about its symbolic representation, not only to the people contained within the district, right, or who live and work here, but also the way that Washington DC holds significance in a very particular, I would say colonial way for the entire country or really the entire world. Um, I think we're able to, again, you know, hopefully intervene to expand beyond a very narrow understanding of space, land and the people living within it. Uh Thank you so much. I have just heard from my compatriot and much better Virgo than I am that we are officially out of time because there's a real class coming in here that at 5.30 that we, 5.15 something, it's coming in here very soon. Okay, so we have to actually get out so that the university can do its other job, which is educating undergrad. Thank you. If you are, um, faculty staff or over 21 you are uh, welcome to join us at a reception on the hall of science plaza upstairs um we look forward to seeing you there